Uh, you're gonna... <laughs> I had to borrow Lynn Whitehaw's readers last time. Yeah, and they worked out great. <laughs> Three, yeah, two. Oh, sad. <laughs> All right, well, I think we'll get started here. Uh, welcome everybody. I see some people just filing in. We have a nice full house here. Um, so I want to welcome you all. I see a lot of wonderful uh, new faces who are part of the Florida craft art family who've come all this way from St. Petersburg to Tarpon Springs. So we really appreciate you coming. Um, and some of our our local supporters too. So thank you all. This is a, a great group of people. Um, I'm Christine Rank Carter. I'm the executive director of the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. And today we have a really special treat for you. Um, we are celebrating all things fine craft throughout the state of Florida. And um, this, this particular program which is collecting contemporary Florida art, fine crafts art, um, is with our wonderful CEO of Florida Craft Art, Katie Dietz, who, um, who has been kind enough to collaborate with the Leeper Ratner Museum of Art on this wonderful exhibition from their permanent collection. That's actually a, somewhat of a debut in our area. It's a traveling exhibition that has been seen elsewhere in the state of Florida, but uh, I think it's being shown for the first time here in the Tampa Bay area. And we're very excited because this allows for a great collaboration between North and South Pinellas County to come together and have a dialogue about fine craftsmen throughout the state of Florida and how it relates to our own collection that has some overlapping works. And um, so we're celebrating this wonderful partnership and connecting bridges between our institutions. And we're just so excited to have everybody here. This is the, the result of that is seeing this wonderful mix of people from all over the county. Um, first of all, uh, before we begin, I just, I'm going to introduce Katie, uh, but I want to first recognize our new curator, Sarah Felice, who just started in April. So welcome, Sarah. And Sarah has been such a wonderful asset to the museum so far. She came right in and uh, picked up where I left off in making sure that this exhibition was organized and pulled out some of the works from our permanent collection to complement Florida Craft Arts collection to create this beautiful exhibition. So this exhibition we called Material Mastery, Florida Craft Art Collection of Fine Craft. And this exhibition has been on view since June 10th and will be on view through August 27th. And we're grateful for our sponsor, Mary Mitchell Avery, who is not with us today, but she has been a wonderful supporter of the arts and especially printmaking and fine crafts in this area. Uh, just to let you know, this is being recorded and it's also being live streamed. So behave yourselves out there. Um, we will have this video available on our YouTube channel shortly, um, probably in the next week or so. If you come visit our website, we'll have that posted. Um, Florida Craft Art is this amazing organization that I know Katie will tell you a little bit more about, but this organization has really elevated fine craft 
and is recognized as an economic generator throughout the state of Florida. It, it, the, the organization has nurtured um, emerging artists for many years. Um, they have stellar exhibitions and they partner with curators from all over the state and bring in work not only from the state of Florida, but all over the country to really elevate the, um, the art of fine craft. Um, they also provide uh, wonderful educational opportunities and programming for the community that extends even into uh, the, mural, um, the mural program that is throughout the city of St. Pete where they offer tours and they have the arts lofts upstairs and it's just a wonderful organization located in downtown St. Petersburg. So if you have not been, then I highly encourage you to go. Now, Katie Dietz has been the Chief Executive Officer of Florida Craft Arts since 2016, where she has become a leader in the arts community and has helped to transform the cultural landscape of downtown St. Petersburg in that time. Prior to Florida Craft Art, she was the Executive Director of the Lighthouse Arts Center near Palm Beach. Katie is also a certified fundraiser, a master photographer, and an amazing artist, and she's very, very active in the community. And her work is actually also represented in this exhibition in a ceramic uh, head bust that we have featured at the entrance of the museum. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Katie Dietz. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Well, it's a, it's a thrill to be here, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I see several people in the audience that are friends and artists and board members, so thank you so much. And uh, I wanted to let you know this talk is not a little bit about the permanent collection, but more about Florida Craft Art and what is fine craft in general. So um, because you're going to be sitting through about an hour long talk, I decided to give you some door prizes. I don't know if you saw them at the front, but we've got a mural tour, some jewelry, and also a t-shirt of Florida Craft Art. So um, I hope you got a ticket. Did you get a ticket, everybody? Okay, excellent. Let's see how to change this. So first of all, I just want to say we are really thrilled to be able to have this exhibit at the Lipa Ratner Museum. And these are some of the photos I took on opening night. And uh, it's a beautiful facility. And it has, the show has been staged so well. I love the space. I love how it's been curated. It's really good. And I want to thank Christine Rank Carter and also the curator who put it together and Mary Mitchell. I'm sorry she's not here tonight, but I hope she gets to see the video. So the sponsorship of exhibitions is so important. Uh, I know at Photocraft Art, we could not do what we do without sponsors. And I think that's true for most nonprofit organizations. We are, you may have seen the uh, book we have in the lobby on the, on the uh, collection. However, it is being re, uh, redesigned by Peggy Stark and that is going to be available soon. So if you'd like to have a copy of it, it will be available on our website. A little bit about Florida Craft Art. We're a statewide nonprofit organization. And what we do is we advance Florida's fine craft artists with opportunities, education. We engage the community, help to teach them about fine craft. We serve as a resource for people who may be collecting art or who are artists who want to know more about advancing their career. We partner with a lot of other organizations and we do grow the creative economy, not just in the Tampa Bay area, but across the state. So our mission is uh, to grow the statewide creative economy by engaging the community and advancing Florida's fine craft art and their, and their work. And this is where our building is located, uh, 5th and Central in downtown St. Pete. So our founders um, were, it was originally known as Florida Craftsmen, but they changed the name a few years ago to make it, I guess, more uh, equal. 
So it's just not just men, because there's a lot of craft, fine craft who are women. It was originally founded and organized by Lewis and Elsa Frund, who were professors of art at Stetson University. Elsa was a jeweler. Can you hear me if I hold the mic down like this? Okay, okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, so she was a jeweler. And if you look up modernist jewelry, she's very well known for her jewelry. And the cut, the reason, and he was a printmaker and also a painter. Um, she, what they wanted to do was to have an organization that was dedicated to fine craft that would elevate it to uh, the art form that the craft so rightly deserved. Organized uh, exhibitions were organized and held across the state. They did not have a, a location uh, where they were showing the work. They, the first exhibit was at uh, Florida State University. And then they had, they hired an executive director and they had um, a couple of different small locations in St. Pete. And then they were offered the Rutland Department Store, which is where we're located now. And in 1995, no, 2002, we, we were there in 1995, 2002, Michelle Teagle, who was the executive director, encouraged the board to buy the building. They bought the building, thank goodness, because I don't think we could afford the rent today. So we, it houses a 2,500 square foot um, retail Florida uh, artist gallery, another exhibition space, and also upstairs are art lofts, and I'll show you some more pictures of that in a minute. So here's our board of directors. We have about, uh, I think six or seven artists on the board and it's led by our board chair, Tyler Jones, who's a terrific artist and a realtor. Uh, we have our staff, which is myself, the director of advancement, Liz Cooper, who used to be the gallery manager. We have a new uh, business and festival manager, Rebecca Nowaki, who comes to us from Toledo Museum of Art, very highly qualified. And our bookkeeper is Doris Connor, who is also a ceramic artist and teaches at the Morian Center for Clay. Um, our gallery manager is also new with us, Michelle Stone. She was formerly with Carol Wood, um, and she is just ter terrific. Uh, you may know Julia Culver, who's been there for quite a few years. Julia, I'm very excited for her. She made the decision to devote herself full-time to the art. She's a fabulous artist. So we're gonna be watching her career. So um, what is fine craft? It's ceramics, fiber, glass, jewelry, metal, mixed media, and wood. Florida um, craft art represents more than 250 uh, Florida artists in our gallery, our retail gallery. And we are also uh, visited by some famous people. Can anyone recognize who this is? Jane Seymour, and she has purchased quite a few things. She's good friends with one of our artists, Kimberly Cummings. And so we're open seven days a week, and we have on display, how many artworks would you guess in that gallery? 12,000 plus. So we also advance Florida's fine craft art exhibition through, um, I mean, exhibition opportunities, promotion, and mentoring. And here's what some of the artists have said about Florida craft art, and I see we've got two of them right back there. Nick Rialli retired from the fire department after 30 years of service to concentrate on his passion for wood turning. His wife, Shelley Steck Rialli, left a career in the nonprofit uh, marketing to embrace her love for art and ceramics. And she was an emerging artist in our Florida Craft Art Festival in 2021. They are both gallery artists and they participate often in the exhibits. In fact, Shelly's going to be, both of them are in our next exhibit and I've got postcards for you and it's awesome. It's called Rebels. So this is what they had to say about Florida craft art. For us starting out and many people, we found also that 
people sometimes have an entire career before they decide to be an artist or to do maybe to go what they love because their parents said, oh, you'll be a starving artist. You got to be an accountant or attorney or something. Anyway, it isn't overwhelming to figure out how to do a new career. So it's not just creating the art, but it's networking, marketing, trying to understand and place uh, their place in the Florida art scene. They said that we stepped up to offer invaluable, invaluable mentoring and support that we've been instrumental in guiding them through the nuts and bolts of developing a successful art career. So thank you all for giving me that nice testimonial. And we're so glad you're in, involved in our organization. Another artist is uh, Mary Ann Ziegler. But she worked with uh, the deaf community in the uh, Pinellas County Schools for many years. And when she retired, she decided to be a class artist. And she again talks about how we have supported her and that she could not have been to the stage of her life without the staff at Florida Craft Art. And she also volunteers for the gallery. So um, that is really nice. We're hoping too that um, she's going to. Uh, work on a program to welcome more of the deaf community to Florida Craft Art. So we're working on that. Susie Pease is also, she's also an emerging artist. And now she can, um, my watch is ringing. She can work full time because of the mentoring and the start she got at Florida Craft Art. She's a ceramic artist and also does jewelry. She has her home studio in Inverness. Lovely, lovely lady. John Maskell is also on our board of directors. He's a longtime member of Florida Craft Art. And he and another artist named Kyunga Janaki, who's from West Palm Beach, had an exhibit, at, um, a dual exhibit at the Hannibal uh, Square Center in Winter Park. And this is a picture of him at um, the exhibit, which was called Soul Utterings. And uh, he also won Best of Show in our beautiful Bowls exhibit and often wins Best of Show at the festivals. And he was an award winner at the Smithsonian Craft uh, Show this year. We also have educational workshops upstairs in um, our creative loft and uh, downstairs. So for all of our programming, um, for all of our exhibits, we have programming that goes along with it. And our creative discovery workshops for children and family are taught by professional artists. And we have written curriculum uh, in accordance with Florida school, school standards, including vocabulary and detailed instructor instructions and a glossary. So uh, for every exhibit, as I said, we have free educational lectures, tours, and there's no admission to the charge for the gallery or any of these events. So there's no financial barrier to anyone, which I think is very important. Our Florida Craft Art Permanent Collection was exhibited at Creal Day in Winter Park, then at the A.E. Bacchus Museum in Fort Pierce, and now we're just so happy to have it here. Thank you. So we have during the year, eight curated exhibits in our exhibition gallery. And this was a fantastic exhibit curated by David Ramsey in collaboration with Duncan McClellan called Clearly Collaborative. That's what that picture is showing. Uh, it was really outstanding. And we are so proud to, to have been able to show that. We also have a book on that. Every year we have a member show which is people from all over the country because we are a member supported organization and we have members in just maybe not every state, but a lot of them. Our current exhibit, which ends Saturday, is the Alchemy of Art, curated by Mary Childs and Elizabeth Brinklow. And if you look at the little chair on there that was made by Nick Rialli and also won an award, and it is an ex really great exhibit. There's going to be a curator's talk at 4 p.m. on Saturday. We'll hope you come to that. And um, we have uh, people 
Some of the artists are, I think there's three artists who are MIT professors, and it's really fantastic. And we had a really good judge for this sitting on the front row, Christine Ray Carter. So thanks, Christine, for judging for us. Oops, wait a minute. Just to give you an idea, that's our Rebel show coming up. And uh, I think you'll be very surprised by a lot of work. It's terrific. And our, our, our next show this year, which is called Artists is Ghost Stories, and that's curated by Catherine Bergman of the Dunedin Fine Arts Center. So that's going to be very exciting. And we'll also have programming such as Nick Frastic with Keep Saint Pete Lit. So you will want to keep in touch with all that. Our final show for the year is our holiday boutique, which runs about two months, and that's a great place to buy gifts or decor. In the weekend before Thanksgiving, we have our craft, Florida Craft Art Festival where artists come from all over the country, uh, more than 100 artists. And we have artist demonstrations, a children's activity tent, and we have a wonderful program, which I really wanted to tell you all about, having mentioned several of the people who have been emerging artists. Um, we have a free program. People just have to apply. There's no charge to apply. And they get $1,000 worth of uh, services, a free tent. Uh, free postcards, free photography with Brian James, mentoring by Duncan McClellan, and it is a great start to your career. So um, that's on our website. We also have sponsors. You can see here in the uh, photograph, Catherine Howd and her husband, Edward Rux. They were sponsors. That's the artist that they sponsored this year. And it, it's, I can't say enough about the program. It's a wonderful program. Very exciting. The Tibetan monks are coming back again this year. They will have an exhibit uh, where they're making um, a mandala in our exhibition gallery. And that will be uh, January 8th through the 14th. And the artists of Art Lofts will be exhibiting their work at the same time. So we expect lots and lots of people and lots of cultural events. So we hope you'll come to that. Um, Christine also mentioned that we have um, walking mural tours. Uh, we're not having any in August. It's a little bit too steamy here, but every other month we do have them. And we also have bike tours the first Saturday of the month. This is a little uh, snapshot of Art Lofts. And I see we have um, Rebecca and her husband, Joe, here, who are Art Loft artists. So thanks for coming up. And they're always open the second Saturday of the month. And so from five to nine o'clock. So do come and see that. So let's get to the presentation. I bet you thought that was the presentation. No, that was just a commercial. So um, what is fine craft? I think I went over the you know, different types of what they're considered. The only thing I would add to this is mixed media is often considered fine craft if there's a lot of mixed on it. And uh, contemporary craft is now recognized as a movement embraced by material-based artists. Now let's talk about what that means. So craft has three historical stages. First of all, originally everything was craft. All the processes were hand processes, whether they were utilitarian, realistic, or I mean ritualistic or decorative. Craftsmen did not sign their work. There were guilds and apprenticeships where people learned their craft. From the time of the Renaissance, artists were becoming recognized for their individual creations. Artists began to sign their work, new ideas and concepts emerged, and there became an intellectual separation between the idea of craft and fine art. With the Industrial Revolution, there was even more of a separation between handmade uh, craft objects and products made by machines. So craft is defined by four identities. One, it must be substantially made by hand. This is the primary root of all craft, the wellspring and reference point for everything else in the field. So craft is two, it's medium specific. So it's either clay or wood or glass. So it's very, uh, very definitely medium specific. And it's also defined by the technologies used to create it. Um, 
Craft is defined by use. Are they, uh, is it functional? Is it decorative? Is it your cup you drink coffee out in the morning? Finally, it is defined by its past. Each craft area has a history that is defined by objects. Many of these societies in our world have disappeared, but the objects have survived, giving us a glimpse of the uh, society's culture. So one of my favorite books is A History of the World, 100 Objects from the British Museum. And if you have a chance, check out that book. It's um, by the director, former director of the British Museum, and he tells the story of humanity painting a compelling portrait of mankind's evolution. He begins with the earliest surviving objects by human hands and ends with 21st century innovation. So it's really interesting. My, my mother, who was blind in the last couple of years of her life, listened to that, books on tape, at least 21 times. She loved it. So throughout the history of craft, people produce useful objects that are often much later considered fine art. Much of the ancient art that we see in museums started out as craft. So these craft objects outlive the people who made and used them. They have become honored for their own sake and are finally considered art. Uh, in her work, The Persistent Object, The Crafts of the Modern World, uh, Rose Slimka says, time has a way of overwhelming the functional values of an object that outlives the people who made them. So let's have a work, look at the different kinds of craft, starting with undoubtedly one of the most complex ones, which is ceramics. This is a piece by nationally recognized St. Petersburg artist and Kenwood resident, Jan Richardson. And she references uh, the Vikings boats uh, and ancient boats in, in this piece. So first of all, there's clay bodies. Um, a ceramic artist first cho chooses a clay body with which to work. Each type has different characteristics and the selection is often determined by the object's eventual use. Common clay bodies are earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. And uh, this is a picture of, the, of them. So um, there's different techniques in, um, in ceramic work. Hand building is one of them. You'll see Diane Lublinsky here making one of her sculptures. Uh, Tyler Jones is throwing on the wheel. And the little picture in the oval is uh, the use of molds. In, so that's a, those are ways to create the uh, uh, art. And often people will possibly throw on the wheel and then they'll alter the object. There's also many, a myriad of surface techniques. I've just listed a few here. Uh, it's such an exciting field. When I got involved in ceramics, I thought this is everything. It is absolutely everything. It's painting, drawing, sculpture. It, you can just explore to your heart's content ceramics. Another thing is surface texture, carving and piercing. Um, uh, artist we have in our gallery named Peggy Nadeau, and uh, she'll uh, put a candle in there and, and watch how the light goes around the room. It's beautiful. Uh, stamping, embossing, edging, um, artist Gail Snively. Graffito, which is an Italian word for scrap to scratch. And what they do is they will uh, make a piece of pottery, put laser slip on it, let it dry, and then use a carving tool to scratch through it. And these are both examples of it, along with some other techniques. Jennifer Rossiter and Julie Harbers. Julie is an uh, Orlando artist. Jennifer works out of the train, uh, train station. So there's slip trailing, lettering, stenciling, dotting, and more. And these are some more examples of it. Uh, also, there's sprigs. Sprigs are created in molds and then taken off and attached to the object, to the piece that has been made. And they attach the sprig to the clay and adhere it with usually a slip or some water. Now, this artist is fantastic. Kimberly Cummings in the yellow dress at the back. That's Kimberly. And uh, 
She has been a very long term since I think 2000 or something you came to the gallery. Long time and she's also a board member and she works, um, she hand paints, all, she makes her work, she hand paints it, she throws a lot, she also hand builds and then she does a process called, what, what, it, it sounds like majolica but it's maholica, isn't it? Myolica, myolica. So um, definitely want to check out her work, it's wonderful. She also has a piece in Rebels that's very moving. So um, I want to see if that's kind of, yeah, for some reason this transferred differently from my computer. But anyway, so glazes and um, slips. So this, these are ways, different ways of applying glazes. Also, there's different firing methods. So ceramics is not simple. You have chemistry with the glazes. Some art, many artists create their own glazes. So firing methods is another way. Electric kilns are normally used for bisque firing and mid-range firing, such as cone sex, which equals about 2100 degrees. Cone 10 goes up to 2300 degrees. Wood firing methods. So um, some artists choose not to decorate their um, pieces instead and I want to see if this is going to play. This is a video, but let's see if it's going to play. I don't think it's going to play. Anyway, let me try it. it is. Yay. So this I shot at the Morian Center for Clay. Uh, they do a major wood firing every year. It's usually in January. And uh, people like Chris Gustin and very famous artists come down at the time. And this shows the process of putting in, and it is a huge team effort. It, they are firing like five days a week, 24 hours a day. And the kiln has to be, uh, uh, you know, kept feeding the, the kiln because it's, uh, you have to keep the fire up. And there's, so, there's some very interesting um, processes here. The wood ash falls off the clay pots, creating wonderful patterns. I'm gonna show you the example. Also, it's called an anagama kiln. And it's very important that it's loaded in a way. Somebody has to be really experienced because you have to think, how is the fire gonna come in? How is the ash going to fall? So at the front, as we saw, is a firebox. And at the other end is a chimney flue. And the fire comes through, the ash falls down and, uh, it's um, it's an it's a really exciting process, and I think quite a bit of beer is consumed over it, <laughs> over it too. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, I uh, would suggest that you go and 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 watch it because uh, the texture it can be a smooth glaze, it can be a rough finish, there can be green. It's just it's fabulous. So um, also another. Uh, method is soda or salt firing. And salt firing is a vapor glazing process where salt or sodium chloride is introduced into the kiln box at, the, at a high temperature. The salt vaporizes and so, sodium vapor combines with silica in the clay surface, forming an extremely hard sodium silicate glaze. With um, baking soda, the sodium vapor uh, flows and it's usually combined with water um, and it flows around the pieces and creates just really interesting things often a glassy glaze which tapers into gradients of color and that's called flashing. Um, a gas fired kiln is usually used to cone one oxidation or and our reduction firing <clears throat> and separate gas kilns are used for sodia or um, soda or salt firing. So raku is a very, very exciting process. And uh, you'll see here artist Tom Davis at the top firing at the Morian. And what they do is they take ceramics out of the kiln when they're still glowing red hot and place them in material inside a trash can, usually, that is able to catch fire. So they'll have all sorts of materials in there. They have newspapers, magazines, just about anything. Then they put the top on it 
to starve oxygen, which creates a myriad of colors within the clays. Very interesting. Also, you can use all kinds of materials. You could use horse hair, have to, have to be around any horses. They make an interesting texture. Um, also at, on the right are pine needles um, that Tom Davis has used. So I talked about cones. What are cones? Well, they're uh, pyrometric devices that are used to gauge the time and the heat of the firing. So many times uh, ceramic artists will go through phases of testing, they'll test the glaze. It's a very long process to get what they want. And they wanna make sure that it fires to the temperature that they want. So those are the, um, those are what, when you hear cone six or that's mid fire, you hear cone 10, that's high fire. And it usually determines what you're going to use it for too. What is the, what is the process? All right, so here's Kimberly Cummings in her studio. And she was at Tampa, um, she was in Tampa um, and she saw this sign, she never worked in clay and it said, come on and call, you've always wanted this. So she worked at the clay factory uh, to study. She didn't work there, she studied there along with many international potters who you'll see these names in art books. Paul Solder, Peter Volkus, Scott Aubrey and Rudy Audio, very well-known artists. And her, um, her work used to have a dark Rudy feeling, but she traded it for a happy feeling and her work is wonderful. She took Linda Arbuckle, who's also very well-known. She was a, a ceramic instructor at uh, University of Florida. And also um, Kimberly was featured her tango dancer series was featured on HGTV's That's Clever. So please talk and say hi to Kimberly at the end. So Julie Harbors, I absolutely love Julie's work. She was born in Wisconsin, was raised in Central Florida. She has a BFA in ceramics from uh, University of Central Florida. She became a, a teacher. She teaches at a school, a couple of um, studios in Orlando and uh, her, her work sort of has a retro feel to me, like uh, postmodernism. Alyssa Ligmont is also a very popular artist. You'll see her in the gallery and also at our Florida Craft Art Festival. The, you see the state of Florida there on that plate? That's actually a grater. So you can grate your uh, garlic or cheese on that. Very clever and a uh, really nice person. Now, Jennifer Sutton Rowe is a ceramicist who has been making handmade objects full time for many years. And she, when you come to our, um, our holiday, you'll see lots of her ceramic ornaments. And many people come in every year to get a different ornament to collect or to give to the children or grandchildren. And uh, she does them all from scratch and she paints them all herself. And she's a really nice person too. Uh, Jan Richardson, I showed you pictures of her before. This is her in her studio at the um, Morian Center for Clay, and she's making these vessels. Uh, I'm trying to remember what those are called. Anyone remember? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember right now. Uh, anyway, she makes these really cool vessels, but she also has is well known internationally. She had a business where she made houses called Windy Meadows Houses. And they were, she had all the Appalachian women in her area making these houses and they sold all over the world. So, uh, and she still teaches classes at the Morian. Um, really great person. Diane Lubinsky, which I showed pictures of her before. And she makes these very interesting creatures um, I love her series on coral reefs, and there's a picture of it there for you to see. William Kidd uh, is one of our best-selling artists, and you'll see him at the festival also, and he wins awards all over. He likes, he's inspired by microorganism, fungi, seeds, cacti, and sea life, but none of these are actual pieces. He makes them up. 
sort of combines all these things in his mind. Uh, fabulous artist. And uh, so our next medium that we're going to talk about is glass. So it is an extremely complex medium with lots of styles. And we were fortunate a few years ago to have a, an exhibit called Quest curated by Mary Childs from the Duncan McClellan um, Gallery. And she helped me put together this part of the presentation because she is an expert on glass. So I'm gonna try and share it with you now. Um, here's Duncan blowing glass, and that's one of his signature pieces. Um, he has been an extremely uh, influential person, not just only for the glass community, but for St. Pete in general, because he uh, helped to start the Warehouse Art District. In fact, here's a picture of his building, which was originally, I think, a tomato packing plant, and he's totally redone it, and the gardens are fabulous. Uh, he has his uh, studio there, I mean, his gallery, and then he also has a wonderful ex a place where artists, visiting artists can come and do blown glass. And also people can come and watch uh, his team do demonstrations. So what exactly is glass bowling? Um, well, this picture show Chuck Bo 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 Books, who is, um, he's blowing glass. He's also one of the original glass blowers in the Tampa Bay area. And um, so they used to be years ago, just used for creating drinking vessel, well, that vessels for, and they can be seen in museums like Mesopotamia or ancient Rome. Um, over centuries, Venetians brought glass blowing to a high art and um, with increased patterns and complex designs to functional pieces. But it wasn't until the late 60s that artists began experimenting with blown glass in abstract and sculptural patterns. Now, I think everyone's probably heard of Dale Chihuly. You've probably seen his museum in, uh, in the St. Petersburg. And so those are some of the artists that, that really started um, and they were pioneers in making that studio glass art instead of just commercial glass. So here's a, another picture of some of the artists who've been in his studio, uh, Jacob Stout and Mario Bass. And the pieces there at the bottom were um, works that we had of hers in the gallery. This glass blowing is a big team effort. So I think this really illustrates that. How many people do you have there working on it? Five. <clears throat> so it's a big team effort, as is ceramics often a uh, team effort. This is, I absolutely adore this woman's work, Elizabeth Sterling. And she does engraving, um, and it's done with wheels um, that are impregnated with diamond grits and allows the artist to, sh to shade and sculpt and uh, it's often done with water. Uh, and Duncan McClellan does represent her. We don't have all of these artists in our gallery because some of them are from out of state. So they may be here in, in Florida Craft Art for a special exhibition, but they're always at Duncan's gallery. And you can also look at them on his website. So another, excuse me, um, is cut, cast, cut, and polished glass. And that's usually done with a grinder or a diamond saw um, and not cast. So I'm gonna show you cast in a minute. Grail is another one and it's engraving combined with glass blowing skills and uh, it was invented in Sweden. And it starts with a blown glass bubble and it consists of more than one layer. So it can be, it's a very interesting technique and Duncan McClellan is really known for that. Hot sculpting. This is Alice Alexis Silk, and I'm going to show you her work. Beautiful. I don't know how she does it. It's amazing. Um, but it gives dimensionality and personality um, to blown glass, which is called the Gather. Um, this is another artist who we've exhibited, Jack Graman, and he does figurative work. 
So can you see in the one with the blue how it's a profile of a person? It's, it's abstract, but it's very interesting. Pat de Vere is a variation of a casting technique and is perhaps one of the most ancient ways of forming glass. Uh, initially, castings were made by pouring molten glass into impressions in sand. Um, crushed glass is used to put into a mold and held, heated to a temperature, and then the glass goes down into a mold, and that's how it's made. And there's uh, lots of so there's a lot of sculpting that goes into that initially using uh, wax, just like you would do bronze casting. Uh, oops, went the wrong way. Sandblasting is another thing that Duncan McClellan is, is known for. And I, I wanted to show you these slides so that you can see how it's done. So you see the white slide with the peacock? That is where it's taped off. And then the artist comes in and cuts away the part that they want to have exposed to sandblast. So I don't have the peacock, I don't have an example of each one of the pieces. So you're going to have to kind of use your imagination with this, but you can see um, one of the things he's really known for is the figurative. You can see the, the middle step, the gray, the sort of greenish one is um, where that's the middle step. And I have um, a picture, two pictures of the actual sandblasting. So the artist reaches in, closes the door, reaches in with gloves and sandblasts and sandblasts and sandblasts. And you can do more than one layer. So a lot of times the artists will blow the glass so that maybe there's red and then there's blue and different colors. And the more you go down with the sandblasting, the more the color, those different colors comes out. So there's a lot of uh, interest with it. And um, so here are some more uh, results. The one on the um, left is Eric Hilton, wonderful artist, and the other two are by Duncan McClellan. Cane is another technique that's used. Those are threads of glass, and they can be stretched, and they can be, there's all sorts of things that can be created. Here's an example um, of a Venetian artist who's created the glass in these beautiful patterns. Um, this is a wonderful artist who I photographed, Nancy Cullen. And she makes these cloud forms and other sculptures. And here's some pictures of her at work. She usually comes once a year to, um, to work at Duncan's studio. And there's the final one. Isn't that cloud beautiful? I love that rainbow cloud. Another technique is flame working. Um, it's often done in a bench with oxygen and glass to perform uh, gas to perform a high intensity flame. And the artist uses canes. And this is an example of, of Jennifer Caldwell's work. And then this is Carrie Russell Poole's. Very interesting. Marini, Marini is where they put different uh, bits of glass together. Um, it's a century old technique. And it was generous, uh, really guarded by the Italians who did that. And they're bundled of canes and made to just, they're marvelous. And uh, I haven't done it myself, but I, I might like to try that. Casting objects is uh, where they uh, pour glass into a mold until it solidifies. This was used, a technique used in ancient Egypt. Um, and modern glass uses many types of processes like kiln uh, casting and casting into sand, graphite, or metal molds. Glass casting, Susan Gott, who is one of our gallery artists, is best known for um, her glass casting, and those are samples of her work. She is in Tampa. Chuck books, I think I showed that before. These are smaller pieces that we have that are not expensive um, that he creates in the gallery for the garden um, or table. And he, um, he started rather late in life, like in his 40s to do jewelry. We have wonderful jewelry. Uh, this is Maureen Shanky, um, 
yes, that's pretty expensive, but boy, is it gorgeous and, and wonderful to collect. Um, and she's a St. Petersburg artist, wins lots of awards. Emily Pritchard is from Panama City, and I fell in love with her pieces because they're very architectural, so interesting. Um, and she was originally from uh, Ohio. She cuts these tubes to lengths to make the geometry of each design work, and then she oxidizes them to darken them. John and Linda Whitney are from Sarasota, uh, and their works are very contemporary, very interesting, and they are dog lovers too. So they got to be good people, right? Fiber. Uh, fiber goes through many different uh, mediums, and I can't show everything here or everyone here, but um, <laughs> Leanne Crush is very well known for her felting, and in the exhibit, you'll see her dress that she made. When you see that dress, it is all made from one piece. There are no seams. It's all done with felting, uh, which is where they take the wool and they scrape it with a needle, and then they wash it, and somehow it all binds together, something like that. Anyway, she's really, really good, and uh, she's won a lot of awards, and we were so happy to have her piece in our collection. Let's see here. Another fiber artist, which is quite, who is quite extraordinary, is Ann Anderson, and she used sisal to create these animals. She was born in Sweden, but she really didn't like that animals, the taxidermy and the wild animals were being killed. So she decided to create these beautiful sculptures so that people um, didn't have to exploit them. And uh, it's a humane alternative to cub petting, trophy hunting, et cetera. Steven Seidlinger is uh, an artist and designer and educator. He taught at Ringling School of Art, and he does embroidery. And these are bookmarks that he's embroidered. He also uh, makes books, and we have all those in the, in the gallery. Mixed media. This is interesting. Spatos, his name, uh, the man who does it is Scott Durfee, and he um, makes them out of palm fronds. So this is another fiber artist. Atomic and Meter, uh, we have a piece of their work in our collection right now, an automatron, and they are national, internationally known glass artists, not glass artists, doll artists. And um, they have this terrific piece that moves and rather scarily, I think. <laughs> so it's Saturday's your last chance to see that. They are St. Petersburg artists and incredibly talented. Um, we have also simple things in the gallery, just so like greeting cards and seasonal crafts. Um, in we, the last category is wood. Larry Rufner is of Wind, Windermere, Florida, and he worked for years as a healthcare executive until he was in an accident and couldn't work anymore. So he took up wood turning, and boy, we're glad. We're sorry he had the accident. But we're glad he took up wood turn uh, woodworking, and he creates these custom rocking chairs, um, and he's never made two alike. He makes them for different size people, so depending on the size, he does the, them custom, and they are really heirlooms. If you want to see one, come into the gallery and try it out. John Maskell, who I mentioned before, he uh, uses often exotic wood, and you'll see this piece right here is the one in the collection, and this is him in, um, winning awards and also on his uh, leg there on the lower uh, left. Tom Davis, uh, I saw you saw him doing Raku. He also works in wood, creating charcuterie platters. And uh, he's a retired Air Force Colonel. You would never know it. He's just so sweet and nice, <laughs> you know, not bossy at all. And uh, he is fascinated with wood and his work sells like crazy, and his work is also in the collection. And finally is, last but not least, is Nick Reale. 
<laughs> in the back row. And this is a piece that he created for our exhibit that's on right now called the Alchemy of Art. And there's no legs on this chair. And he wanted to make it look magical. So he designed this and we're very thrilled. The other chair, uh, I just want to mention because I think the concept was so thoughtful and sweet. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago or maybe it's three or four, um, there was a banyan tree in a neighborhood and the banyan tree had to cut down. The neighborhood was all upset. All the neighbors were upset for this beautiful banyan tree, but it had to be cut down. Well, Nick went and reclaimed the wood, all of his wood. He doesn't buy any wood. It's all reclaimed. And uh, so he went, he bought that, dried the wood out and everything. He made this rocking chair, but he also made bowls for the people in the neighborhood and gave them to him. Very sweet guy. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm a fan. So Florida Craft Art, we're open seven days a week, as I mentioned. We hope you'll come to visit us. I am so honored to be able to give you this presentation, and I hope that, uh, that you enjoyed it. Thank you. And now, after all this time, we have some door prizes. So do you, you should draw, I think. Yeah. So the first door prize, well, let's let people choose what they want. So we have a mural tour for two. We have um, a pin by Gianna Paragamo. <laughs> 